right. Well, this is Donna Otto. I'm president of the South Texas Border Chapter of the Texas Master Naturalist. And this is our, what is this, July meeting of the, our general meeting. And tonight the presentation is going to be by uh, Dr. Jude Benavides. He's an environmental scientist and engineer with a focus area in hydrology and geographic information systems. He has over 20 years academic experience and holds the rank of Associate Professor of Environmental Science and Hydrology at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. And Dr. Benavides, if you'd like to introduce yourself further, uh, welcome and thank you so much for offering to give us this program. My pleasure. Uh, Donna, how much time did you need me to go on that? We have an hour, and that includes your question and answer time. Perfect. Okay, great. So uh, I have the floor? Yep. All right, everybody drop and give me 10 push-ups. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I really enjoy presenting to the uh, Master Naturalist Group. Um, I've had a... Uh, what I think is a very fruitful relationship uh, with the organization in the sense that several of my uh, ex and current students have, have gone through the program. I've had people that have gone through the program that have contacted me after a presentation of mine and sometimes uh, in, in one or two cases over the course of the last uh, 15 years, we've had some people come in and get their master's degrees. Uh, so uh, I, I love speaking to the group. I wish that we could get back together in person, but I do applaud and respect the fact that, uh, like always, the Master Naturalist Group has adapted to the times, um, and it's a, it's a sign of your um, flexibility and ad ad adaptation that uh, enables me to present here today. I've got two young kids, and I try to minimize exposure. I've got every shot that they've tried to throw at me, and, uh, uh, and so far, knock on wood, I have yet to officially contract COVID, although I think I swear I did have it. Um, my, uh, my background, uh, as was stated, is in hydrology, water resources. So I'm not a meteorologist, nor am I a climatologist, but I am a Brownsville native. And I was born and raised here um, and then left uh, when I was 18 to go to the University of Notre Dame, got my Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. Uh, then I received a commission in the United States Navy because I did ROTC there. Uh, and so I served active duty in the Navy from 92 to 98. Uh, where I commissioned the uh, Harry S. Truman, an aircraft carrier that is still in service today. In fact, the fuel that we put in her uh, in 1998 is still powering that uh, uh, aircraft carrier uh, and will not need refueling, I think, until next year. Uh, and so that's something I'm very proud of. And then I got my uh, graduate degrees in um, uh, my master's and my PhD from Rice University. Finished that up in 2005, and then I uh, took a job here with uh, my fiance at the time, and now wife, uh, at UTB TSC. And then it became UTB, and now it is UTRGV. Uh, so I've had the same job under three separate institutions, uh, and I've been very happy. Uh, I've put down roots here. My wife and I have two children, Sebastian, who is seven, and Alessandra, who is going to be six next month. Um, and we live here in Brownsville, uh, and one of my passions has always been, uh, the, the curiosity has always been uh, the discussion of hurricanes and hurricane season. And I think it's important to talk to master naturalists about this because of the role of that hurricanes play in our climatology, in our weather patterns, in our water uh, resources uh, in this region, and how the, the system has adapted to these periodic pulses of, of heavy and frequent storms. The title of my talk, which I've been given now for a few years, is called Beulah, Where You Been? Uh, back uh, now over, cl closing in on 55 years ago, uh, Hurricane Beulah, uh, which, whose track is shown here, uh, from uh, Tuesday, September 5th of, 19, of 1967 to Friday, September 22nd, 1967, uh, shown here on the right. Can you see my, my um, cursor when I move the cursor? Yes. Okay, great. This track here you can see, uh, we're going to go into detail here, uh, but kind of shoots this gap right here, all right, uh, the Yucatan Strait, uh, the Straits of Yucatan, and when it shoots that gap and it's heading in that roughly west-northwesterly direction, uh, alarm bells should be going off in deep south Texas and in Texas in general because the natural curvature of the hurricanes as it heads up a little bit towards the westerlies will start to pull the storm uh, this way. 
unusual, very unusual, but can happen. Hurricanes go the way they want to go. Uh, this made a sudden turn to the southwest, which is very, very unusual uh, for hurricanes. And we'll talk about what happened and the damage that that turn caused. Um, because we are now 55 years in, you'll 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 hear that number again or thereabouts uh, again when we talk about the expected frequency of such a large hurricane like your uh, like Hurricane Beulah. Now get out of the way right now that those of you that were uh, in the area or that recall Hurricane Beulah or that knew somebody who did, at the time it was categorized as a category three. Still a major hurricane, but a category three. However, it has posthumously, which I did not know until I started this research about 10 years ago, could happen. It has been upgraded to a category five based on damage reports, other wind reports, satellite analysis of satellite imagery uh, it was indeed a, an exceptionally powerful storm and to this to this day remains the storm the hurricane of record for this region meaning a storm that changed a lot of our planning a lot of our designing as far as flood protection and a lot of our uh, 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 concerns as far as what this area would need to do to survive and uh, and get back to business as usual after a hurricane like this would strike. So to start off with, it's always good to start off with some pictures. Here's a picture of the, um, the Valley Morning Star uh, from Friday, October 20th, 1967, about a month after the storm. Uh, why a month after the storm? Well, because stuff was finally starting to happen again a month after the storm. Uh, I was negative two uh, years, three months old at the time. Uh, but I grew up in the same house that my parents weathered the storm in. Uh, and there was a big crack that I always fascinated, that, that fascinated me in our laundry room, uh, in our hallway that was brick. The brick facade of the house had a big crack in it. They went from ceiling to floor, kind of a big S-shaped pattern. I always wondered where that went. And my father said, that was from Hurricane Beulah. And uh, I said, wow. Um, and as I grew older, I would always argue with my dad about whether or not they made the right decision uh, to shelter in place instead of evacuate. And he would point to the fact that I was standing there and that they were standing there as the right decision. And I would point to the crack as the decision being the wrong one. Uh, many, many people were very, very fortunate. The, um, um, while the damage was significant, uh, the death toll was surprisingly low. In fact, uh, uh, there was only a few deaths that were indirectly tied to this hurricane. When I say indirectly, it was either something that was caused, a health condition that could not be addressed or continued, uh, perhaps a uh, uh, heart attack, uh, et cetera, along the, in the valley area. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there were some, uh, I believe four or five other deaths in Texas, not in the deep south, uh, south area of Texas, resulting in hurricanes that were spawned by this massive storm. There's some more pictures here. This is uh, Elizabeth and 8th Street. I, I often give the, um, the presentation downtown. Those of you that are familiar uh, with Brownsville uh, know Elizabeth Street and uh, there was standing water in all of the buildings. Um, the uh, turning basin and the shrimping uh, basin that was, the shrimp basin that was much more uh, active then than it is today uh, was an absolute mess after the strike. With, store, uh, with these boats being cast deeply inland uh, and deposited in nests of boats, taking months uh, to uh, recuperate from and clean up. The area around Harlingen, uh, particularly Parkwood and Arroyo Estates, was exceptionally flooded. And we'll talk about that reason uh, and why. Many of you probably already know, particularly those of you from the Harlingen area. The Arroyo Colorado serves many purposes for us, and, and those of you that know me know that I serve on the Arroyo Colorado Watershed uh, Committee uh, Partnership, and uh, I've been fortunate, thanks to the uh, uh, Tony Reisinger volunteering me many years ago, uh, I've enjoyed being the chair of the uh, of that partnership, of the steering committee of that partnership for over, well, going on 15 years now, Tony, if you can believe it. Um, the, uh, the Arroyo uh, unfortunately, uh, could not handle the amount of water that was being diverted to it from the river. Um, there are a lot of debate and discussion as to why the diversion dike failed. 
um, and um, and whether it was done intentionally or if it just happened to fail. But either way, that diversion dike failed and a lot more water went through Harlingen that was supposed to. And the Arroyo flooded its banks and flooded uh, hundreds of homes. And we're talking to ceiling height. We're not talking a few standing feet of water uh, or a foot or two of water like you saw in Brownsville. It was devastating uh, uh, to these uh, communities. Some more pictures. This is uh, water lapping at the very bottom of the US 77 bridge over the Arroyo as the stream went out of its banks for the first time in years. Wind damage uh, and wind blowing was significant. We were fortunate in the sense that the, the eye, while it did pass across the valley, was just a little bit to the northeast of Brownsville and Harlingen when it passed meaning that we got the slightly weaker side, although it's still intensively strong, the slightly weaker side of Beulah's punch. In other words, it's left hook instead of its right hook. And uh, the, uh, and those of you that will talk about hurricanes here, those of you that know in the direction that it's traveling, because it's spinning counterclockwise, that counterclockwise motion on the right-hand side of the storm as, it, as compared to the direction that it's traveling, is you're adding the rotational speed of the storm, which in Beulah's case is exceptionally large, plus the forward motion of the storm. While on the left-hand side, the rotational, you, add the, you subtract the forward motion of the storm from the, that uh, rotational speed. So if you're talking a storm like this, 155 miles per hour, it's moving at 15 miles per hour, that means that right side is gonna get 155 plus 15, 170 miles per hour which on the left-hand side of the eye, you're gonna get 155 minus 15, which is 140. Now, both are devastating, but if you had to choose, I'd take the 140 over the 170 any day. I'd choose neither if I could, but if I was forced to choose between the two, I would choose that left one. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Some more images, these, all of these images that you see here, this is along the Rio Grande. Uh, all of these images you see here are part of the Dr. Mar uh, Mario Ramirez Hurricane uh, Beulah uh, photograph collection that's available up in Austin and in various places and now being placed online uh, by volunteers. It is a tremendous and one of the best cataloged set of pictures that you can find uh, for Beulah because recall Beulah happened just at the, uh, the center of the, uh, really, uh, of, the, of the space race. And we had just started to put up weather satellites and just started to get images like this, okay? Um, and this is another reason why Beulah is in many record books and discussions uh, uh, amongst uh, hurricane uh, uh, experts because uh, we were starting to get more refined satellite imagery and we could actually see uh, technically see these storms from space for the first time. And instead of relying on folks from the Yucatan or on uh, lucky boats out in the Gulf of Mexico to relay radio and weather information uh, to us. So, how often, I have a question for the group, uh, to try to get a little bit of interaction through this uh, realm, this portal of, of uh, of our computers. Uh, how often do you think hurricanes strike the valley? Any guesses? Is no one saying anything or can I not hear anybody? About every six years. Okay, every six years. So, uh, and are you, uh, whoever spoke up, is that you, Thomas? Yes. Thomas, uh, are you talking about tropical storm, category one, category five? This doesn't matter, right? Doesn't matter, yeah. Good, good. We, yeah. we also have 10 years, every 10 years in chat and every 13 years. Yeah, good. So we have different, what we call return periods or recurrence intervals, depending on what type of storm you're talking about. And clearly, more, it should uh, be common sense that more powerful storms happen much less frequently, thank heavens. Okay, so we have this thing called a recurrence interval or a return period, the period of time between something happening, like a cycle of a, uh, of a stoplight or the ringing of a bell uh, or um, the, uh, in this case, the passage of a hurricane within a certain distance of a location. 
Okay. And as a rule of thumb, well, we often use 65 nautical mile radius from around a point. Okay. Uh, because that's really the damaging winds center of a hurricane. Really, this, the exceptionally damaging winds, the hurricane force winds of a large hurricane. Uh, so we have something here called, on the left column here, recurrence intervals, which you may hear re refer to as return period. And this unit is in years, 100 years. Something could happen only once on average every 100 years, once every 50 years, once every 25 years, et cetera. We used to use this as the, when I say we, uh, meteorologists, climatologists, hydrologists, and hydrologists are still guilty of this, saying a 100-year storm or a 50-year storm. What are those? There's a significant downside to using that type of data point to describe danger or risk to the public. Can anyone expand on that for me? For example, if I were to say this storm has a 100 year return period, what is generally the next question? Well, sense of security for the next time. Exactly right, man. Exactly right. Particularly if it just happened, right? Like, well, hey, it happened last month, so we're good for another 100 years, according to the quote-unquote experts. And then, of course, it happens again a couple years later. And who can predict Mother Nature? Yeah, that's exactly the scientist's job, right? Uh, the problem is that that is on average, meaning long periods. And, and whoever posted who can predict Mother Nature – that's actually the biggest problem, is that we have a limited amount of data. But we, as scientists, we have to work with the data we have. And we have to make our best possible educated estimates or guesses based off that data. Always improving, always modifying. And in this day and age, of if you're not right 100% of the time, you are wrong 100% of the time. Uh, particularly in this digital era and modern era and, and, and some views of some people's views towards science, that is particularly dangerous. Uh, because while that recurrence interval approach is potentially flawed if somebody misunderstands it, it is technically correct. However, I enjoy and prefer to say instead of a 100-year interval, you give it a percent chance of occurrence in any given year. So a 100-year interval is not meaning that you're only going to get that storm once every 100 years. It means the odds of it happening over a prolonged period of several thousand years, once every 100 years on average, but it's actually a 1% chance of happening a year, which means that you could have storms back to back. You could have two massive storms in a year. It is exceptionally unlikely, but it could happen. You could go two, 300 years without that storm. It, again, is unlikely, but it could happen. So you see the relationship here. A 50-year return period means 1 in 50, uh, one, in, uh, uh, 1 in 50 chance, or a 2% chance happening any given year. A 10-year storm, a 1 in 10 chance, or about a 10% chance a year. A two-year event, something with a return period of every two years, means you got a 50-50 chance of it happening each year. So. We've talked already about some estimates of hurricanes and saying, hey, about six years for a tropical storm or hurricane of any category. It's about right. Five to seven years is about the ballpark for this region. Doesn't mean that if we haven't had a, hur a hurricane or a tropical storm in seven years, that the data was necessarily, necessarily wrong. If we go for several, several years, yes, Tony, absolutely. In 1933, two storms did hit the valley. Uh, we'll talk about those here in a second. So there's a lot to soak in here. But now let me start showing you some graphics. Can you all see that? Okay. That color coming across all right? Yeah. Great. This is from the HERDAT, or Hurricane Database, or IB Tracks. Um, and IB Tracks and HERDAT work together to, uh, and they've been working, uh, this is not my work. This is, a, this is reporting of other people's work that is easily available online. Well, I won't necessarily say it that easily, but you got you can do some searching and verify it for yourself. But it is the uh, uh, a, a hurricane database that goes back effectively now 172 years. I only have this updated to 2012. Uh, so in this case, it's 162 years. Now, how did we get hurricane tracks way back in 1850 or 1860 or 1870? Well, the answer is our certainty in that is much lower. However, these patterns tend to repeat. 
and we then somebody took a lot of anecdotal evidence from ships from locations looking at uh, news reports looking at damage reports etc and consolidated these things and said we think well something hit the yucatan then something hit south texas and then a few days later there was that same event in alabama and so we think that this was a storm passing through this area uh now once we get into the more modern age uh of uh television, radio, and particularly satellite and radar, radar and then satellites, we get much more precise estimates of these tracks. The output though, if you were to accept this as correct, and again, this is not my database, this is the uh, international or the uh, uh, United States hurricane database, shows that within 65 nautical miles of Brownsville, or roughly this kind of little circle right here, uh, from 1850 to 2012, there were 40 storms of either tropical storm or hurricane of any category. So with this data, you're talking about a four year return period, 4.05, or about a 25% chance in any year. So like I said, five to seven, four to seven, in that ballpark uh, falls our percentage chance of receiving a storm of that frequency. And you can see where they come from. What is the principal direction that they come from? Anyone? This is the leaving the area, and I really should adjust this to show arrows, but you know that they're coming from this side over here, right? So what's the primary one they're coming from? South, southeast. Yeah, you look like you got a south, southeast window, you got a southeast window, and you've got an easterly window, which is not too common right now. For some reason, this easterly approach has really slowed down and only happened really in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. Uh, and again, in 1880, would of any significant, uh, and that's good for us, because we'll talk about those factors later. We don't like these storms coming in right perpendicular to us. If you had, you'd rather them come this way. Now, you don't want them shooting this gap. We'll talk about here th this here in a second. But let's compare these. Uh, remember that number, 40 storms for Brownsville within 65 nautical miles. Well, let's take a look at Houston. 64 storms within that same time period, vice 40. So that's a 40% chance in any given year of a tropical storm or hurricane of any category. That's a two and a half year return period. Let's look at New Orleans. Now 75 storms within that return period, within that period of 1850 to 2012. 46% chance of any given year of a storm passing within that uh, range, 64 nautical miles. 65 nautical miles. And look at Miami, almost 100 storms in that 162 year period, or a 1.64 year return period, or a 61% chance on any given year. South Florida has been exceptionally lucky over the last couple of decades uh, as they have gone through a much lower frequency chance. And we're not exactly sure why. It's probably just happenstance, probably just luck. But Cape Hatteras, also 100 storms in that period. And you can see why. They tend to come this way and skirt the coast. And they're in that area. Now let's take a look at only hurricanes, not tropical storms and hurricanes category one through five. We're talking about a category one through five hurricane. At this point now looking at Brownsville, 20 storms or about an eight year return period, about a 12% chance at any given year of a hurricane of any category passing within 65 nautical miles of Brownsville. And you can start to see a lot of the noise clears up, right? You can start to see these very this, uh, significant patterns. And you can see these darker colors or these more purple pink colors where they're coming from, right? They're not starting in the Gulf. They're starting way over here. In fact, they started way over here past the Antilles, way into the Cape Verde Islands, off uh, almost halfway or three quarters of the way to Africa. Major hurricanes passing through that 65 nautical mile range around Brownsville. Category three four or five. The hurricanes you really don't want to mess with. Means we had we had uh, uh, the uh, the storms, the number of storms we could see there, six within that return within that period, leading to a 27.8 year return period. 
or about a 3.6% chance in any given year. A much smaller chance, thank heavens. And you can see those storms on the right. We had one in 1880, unnamed. In August, we had another in 1916. In August, we had another in 1933. That was one of the two. Uh, in uh, August and September, we had Beulah in 67. We had Allen in 1980. And we had Brett in 1999. But Brett barely started that. It was on the outer range. So you could argue, well, that was kind of way out there, and, and it really didn't affect the valley all that much. It did do some damage, but it was not um, a, uh, a direct strike by any means. It did cause some significant rain and some flooding, uh, but we were on the weaker side, and it was about 65 nautical miles away from uh, Brownsville and about uh, 35 to 40 nautical miles away from Harlingen when it passed. Uh, through and that was uh, Brett was that was 1999. But you can see here these storms are shooting this gap either here or here. There's one storm that was Brett that started in the in the Gulf and moved up this way. The vast majority of these storms start way over here and have all of this fetch or warm water to move through and gyres and eddies of warm water to pass through uh, and uh, can provide us with a, uh, can hit us uh, very, very strongly, affect us very, very strongly. So now if you look at this, you might say, well, 3.6% chance on any given year. I'm a gambler. I, I'll take those odds any day. Well, the thing is you got to play this game every year. And if you're living in the area and you, I don't know, buy a house and, and you take a 30-year mortgage, Right, three point six percent chance every year means you have a sixty-seven percent chance of experiencing that over that thirty-year period. If you extend that to fifty years, it's an eighty-six percent chance. Which means, hey, odds are you're going to experience your house is going to experience a major hurricane. Now, that doesn't mean that we get them more than anybody else. In fact, we're going to show the opposite here in a second. But for major hurricanes, we're about average with the rest of the coastline, the Gulf of Mexico and Southeast coastline. For all hurricanes of any category in tropical storms, we're much lower than the average strike frequency. And that was shocking to me because I grew up in, in Brownsville in the 1970s and 80s. It was a few years after Beulah, uh, Anita, Allen. There was some, and Allen, which we'll talk about here, the one of the strongest storms on record. Uh, freaked the living heck out of everybody here just 13 years after Beulah. And because of that, I grew up with the everybody telling me this was Hurricane Central, you know, uh, and maybe for a while it felt like that, but the data doesn't support that. Doesn't mean that it's not going to happen, and uh, it could happen this season. Uh, we're due, but let's talk about these storms and look at the tracks and see the similarities in the tracks. In 1880, this was the uh, the hurricane that passed again, shooting that gap very similar to Allen in its approach. Okay, uh, reaching uh, category two and then being weakened by the Yucatan, which is our hurricane shield. The Yucatan is South Texas, and this is one of the reasons that I'd like you to take home with or walk away with is why are we lower frequency strike or lower strike weak. The strike frequency than many other areas along the coast. And we owe it, number one, to the Yucatan and the shallow waters around it. That will, even though the Yucatan here is very flat, that land, that, that, that hurricane gets its energy from that warm water. When it passes over land, you don't get that evaporative cooling, we don't get that energy boost, and hurricanes weaken significantly, in this case, from a category two to a tropical storm. But it hit that warm water gyre that we have right here in this little deeper section of the Gulf, and it ramped from a tropical storm up to a Category 5, a strong Category 4, excuse me, almost a Category 5, five mile per hour short uh, in that one and a half, two day range. That must have shocked the living heck out of the people in, the, in, in this area in 1880. Because remember, no advance warnings, no 
radar, no satellite. And even if you speak, which they did, I'm sure, to people in Mexico, you got, oh, yeah, it's a Category 2. Nothing to worry about until here. 1916, very similar track, shifted northward just a bit. You can see it didn't get that weakening, went from a category, a tropical storm, category one, category two, to a category three, to a category four. And shot the gap, didn't cross land at all, except for Jamaica here. Now, this is a very common track direction for powerful storms. You can see now that this, this line, in order to not pass over land, has to be shifted up a little northward, right? Which means as the storm comes this way and the storm is rotating like this, all of these folks here are going to get the right side, the dangerous side. These folks down here are going to get the weaker side. So advantage number two is that when storms do come our way, they tend to come from the southeast, south-southeast, expressing its weaker side if it does hit us. Because if the right side is going to hit us, they're going to have to come from down here. And they're going to have to cross a lot of land and shallower water. Now, they can suddenly change direction, like Beulah did, but that's very rare, which leads to less frequent occurrences. Does that make sense to folks? Because I want, to take, I want you to take those two points away from the talk. Yes. Compare that to Houston. Use this strike angle right here. And look at Houston, and their land is facing, their shoreline, instead of facing east, is facing the southeast. So they're going to take a direct perpendicular hit. It is very common for them to experience the right side, damaging side of a hurricane. Powerful one. New Orleans, even worse, because it's going to come up and curve this way. In other words, the more perpendicular the strike, the direction of the hurricane travel to the land, the more damaging those effects commonly are to the right-hand side of the storm, or to those located to the right side of the eye, just to the right. Greater storm surge, greater wind speeds, greater rainfall amounts, not always greater rainfall amounts. That has a lot more to do with the forward speed of the storm. But that first initial wallop, particularly the most damaging component of the hurricane, which is what? Anyone? Here's the most damaging method or component of a hurricane. Rain? No. That's a good guess. I would guess that too, but it isn't. Wind surge. Storm surge. Yes, sir. Storm surge. By far and away, accounting for over 70% of hurricane damage. Largely limited. Okay. Yes, yeah, so a storm surge does differ with orientation of the coast significantly. The more perpendicular, the harder and higher that storm surge comes. Okay. Now, the disadvantage of a, of, of a uh, off-angle strike is that it's not going to be as high, but it's going to be spread over a much larger area. And that should kind of make sense, right? So let's look at some more. 1933. This is the scary one. This is what I envision in my head as, oh my gosh, it's going to wipe us off the map. First off, it's a Cape Verde storm, which starts way over here. Okay, ramped up from a tropical depression to a tropical storm and reached category five. Then dropped to category three as it interacted with the mountains of Cuba and passed the Florida Straits, but then ramped up again to a category four and fortunately dropped down to a category three before it struck us. But it struck us with that full right force, that full perpendicular strike, an uncommon direction for us but does happen. Please be cautious of these in particular, because that's going to, fortunately, again, right, down, right there, the worst case scenario is a category five coming directly from the east that slightly impacts south of us, the south of Matamoros. That would be the worst for us. With its right-hand side coming right up the river delta, right up the mouth of the river, huge storm surge, huge amount of rain, and then continuing on into Monterrey, dumping a lot of rain in Monterrey, and the floodwaters coming off the mountain and hitting us about five to six days later after we've been soaked by the rain of the hurricane. That is going to happen eventually, hopefully sometime way in the future. 
Beulah, the storm that titled this talk. September 5th to the 22nd, 1967, landfall mouth of the Rio Grande, north of Brownsville. Uh, 160 miles per hour is now the official uh, sustained one minute winds. Highest one minute sustained winds of 160. At the time, it was 137. Uh, but unfortunately, the anemometer that was on top of the weather station that measured these things got bent by Hurricane Beulah. And so some simple mathematics that was done much later and some corroboration with the damage that was done and the satellite imagery and the pressure readings showed that this was indeed in Category 5. Similar track pattern, a little bit more wavy. Did interact with the Yucatan, but suddenly ramped up again. Damaging us and then taking that very unusual left turn and into Monterrey. Instead of sparing us the inland rains going this way, it dumped the inland rains in Monterrey, which caused that flooding that broke the dike that flooded Harlingen. It was this right here that flooded Harlingen, not this. This flooded Brownsville. You saw the difference. You can see how the, the data we have shows the uh, over time, okay, these, the pressure, all right, uh, and wind speeds varying in the hurricane, okay? And those max sustained winds reported uh, through that period over time, we have weaker and stronger moments in the storm. You can see that, that track pattern just to the northeast of Brownsville and Harlingen. At that point, it really doesn't matter, but that is better than had it come right through here. Again, you prefer even either one of these, but then this one. Who's around for Hurricane Allen? Anyone? I was. Okay. Uh, do you recall the? Uh, were you in the valley at the time? No, I was in Live Oak County. Okay, was, was anybody in the valley at that time? Or, or was I the only one? I was here, but I was two years old. <laughs> Nobody else? Well, the National Weather Service put out a, uh, a shortwave and all stations radio broadcast, which they rarely do, when they saw what had happened to Hurricane Allen right from here to here. At this point here, Okay. The just prior to landfall, the max recorded winds of Hurricane Allen, just 24 hours prior to landfall, was 180 miles per hour. Not 155, not 160 of Hurricane Beulah, but 180. That if we had a category six, folks, that would be a category six. The National Weather Service was so concerned that they put out this emergency broadcast, shortwave, remember this is pre-internet, trying to get to anyone and everybody. And the, the announcement went something to the effect of this. Hurricane Allen located X and Y coordinates approximately 100 miles to the south, southeast of Brownsville, Texas. Expected impact somewhere in the vicinity of Brownsville, Texas, Matamoros, Mexico. Sustained winds of 180 miles per hour. Gusts recorded of over 220. Enormous storm envelope, damaging hurricane winds in, uh, outside of 75 to 100 nautical miles of the center of the eye. Devastating and impending, devastating damage expected, impending disaster. May God be with you. Oof. That was the extent of the uh, announcement. I had been given three tablespoons of Benadryl from my mother a little bit before this. So I slept through the whole darn thing because uh, she got confused. Uh, somebody told her, what, she said, what should I do with my boy? Because we all went from all our neighbor's homes. We went to our neighbor who had built this home that was supposedly hurricane proof. Uh, he was a construction guy and he had put rebar in the, in the, in the roof and all sorts of things. And, and he, we had seven families taking shelter here. It was our impromptu shelter when that broadcast hit. I saw my father's look in his eyes. And my father at the time was 
57 years old and at my a 10 year old boy seeing a father scared for the first time truly truly scared fearing that they had made the wrong decision to stay uh, well basically scared the poop out of me and so my my uh mother asked what they should what she should do with me because you know she was very nervous my dad was very nervous everybody they said well give him some benadryl give him three spoons of benadryl they meant three teaspoons not three tablespoons i was out for like 24 hours um i woke up the next day the birds were singing the sun was shining i thought i was in heaven um and so something happened with hurricane allen right before striking us anyone know turn northward it did turn a little bit northward okay you can see that in the track which saved us because it was heading straight for us but it wasn't that that really saved us you see a sudden weakening from the pink h5 to a red h3 it was almost an h2 within a period of 12 hours right before it struck what causes a storm to do that it hadn't hit land yet cold water Mm, that will do it, but there was warm water there. The eye wall weakened? Exactly. Hurricanes can get so massive, thank heavens, that they have to replace their eye wall. The eye wall gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it starts to get torn apart by the centrifugal force. And then it builds again. When it does build that interior small eye again, the storm weakens significantly, at least one category on average two, sometimes three. Hurricane Allen is on record as being the only Atlantic hurricane that went through three eye wall replacement cycles. And you can all see them here. Right here, went through one replacement cycle. One, two, three. You see the purple, H5, H4, H5, H4, H5, H3, almost H2. The National Weather Service was not forecasting that. It had just gone through an eyewall replacement cycle. It wasn't supposed to do it. It did. Why? Science can only throw up its hands and say, we don't know. I can tell you that I think it was my grandmother's prayers and just about the thousands of other grandmothers in the valley praying and helping us. But that's just my feeling because there was no scientific reason for this sudden decrease in strength. It saved us from literally, probably being wiped off the map. You can see the three eye wall replacements here. One, two, three. Every time it weakens. And that was a significant one uh, that happened ahead of schedule and right before landfall. We had a chat question. How did that super fancy hurricane group house uh, fare? Actually, the, the max sustained winds we saw in Brownsville as a result of this, because we were slightly on the weaker side right here, and, and, and it was a category three, was 80 miles per hour with gusts of 95. Did fine. There was tree damage and a few houses damage here and there, but it was not a devastating. Now, when I say it wasn't devastating, there are some homes that did get damaged. There was a couple tornadoes that popped up. And those unlucky few did, you know, I mean, that's, if you lose your house, uh, that's, hey, to, I, I don't mean to belittle that, but it was significantly, or orders of magnitude less damage than was expected. Still significant amount of damage to agriculture, the rain, the flooding, et cetera, but nothing like what it could have been had this not happened. That little jaunt to the right, so it was going to come right in here, and that sudden eye wall replacement. Then there's Hurricane Brett, which we've already talked about, kind of curving and scooting around the right. So in the remaining few minutes that I have to discuss uh, frequency strikes and, and now say, OK, well, what about the rest of the eastern side of the, you know, the coastal Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico coast of the United States? The way we look at that is we count the number of strikes over a certain amount of, of uh, a certain period of time. And you look at and, and look at return periods. So you can look at frequency, how many happen over a period of time, or you just take the inverse of that, how long between each occurrence, okay? You want fewer storms in a given amount of time, and you want longer time between those occurrences. 
And this basically shows, this is not my data again, this is the National Weather Service's National Hurricane Center Technical Note 46, which colors the entire coast by counting, showing how many hurricane strikes there were from 1900 to 2009. And you can see ours is light blue, which is seven to nine. Right here. And you can compare, you don't see any light blue or blue, except for here, here, along the uh, Gulf of Mexico coastal bend of Florida, the Georgia coastline, and then until you get up to Delaware. Now, there's some reasons for that that means it's not necessarily an absolutely fair comparison, but you can see the hurricane hotspots that we talked about, Houston, New Orleans, Miami, and we go and build big cities right there, right? Amazing. Cape Hatteras. In fact, as far as total strikes, we have the same category, seven to nine, as Long Island, New York. The eastern end of Long Island has actually more. So you're talking about when I started studying this and I was hired by BCIC uh, uh, back in 2010 to start compile this data, 2012, um, I was kind of surprised by this information. I said, well, that's, that's one piece of data. Well, let's look at somebody else's piece. Of data. And you can see the numbers. This lower is better. Number nine storms. You can see 14, 12, 17, 13, 25 in Plaquemine County, 21 in Galveston. And with the exception of the coastal bend in Georgia, right here, the coastal bend of Florida, we are basically lower on the lower end of that return. And you can see this graphically. The blue line shows tropical storms and hurricanes from Brownsville all along Galveston, New Orleans, this is up the coast, all the way to Eastport, Maine. You can see that high peak in Cape Hatteras. You can see another peak around Miami. You can see another peak around New Orleans. But you can see we're way low on this. That's for tropical storms and hurricanes. But now let's look at just major hurricanes. You can see the peak here in New Orleans, a small peak in Galveston, Houston, a peak here in New Orleans, a big peak in Miami, the big peak in Cape, Cape Hatteras. But we're about average for hurricane, major hurricanes. So if you have to sum our threat up, you can say, well, sorry, our return periods were analyzed by another set of folks, Kime et al, Kime and Mueller from uh, Texas A&M University Galveston. And then when it did, did the same thing and looked at it return period wise, and you can see Brownsville has about a five year return period for tropical storms and hurricanes, which is larger than just about anywhere along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, which is good. That means only once every five years instead of once every three. And you don't see that five again until Georgia and you don't see that five again until Delaware. Things change a little bit for hurricanes, major hurricanes, 52 years. Now, remember I told you, or those of you remember that Hurricane Beulah struck in 1967. It's been 55 years. Does that mean we're more likely to get one? No. What it means is it's been a while since we've had one. So when one does come, so people are going to say, ah, there you go. Has anyone seen the movie The World According to Garp? Robin Williams, early 1980s. No one? That's going to be a first. I'm going to strike out. Wow. Okay. I don't have the, uh, I, I don't want to risk um, playing the video and then you all not being able to hear it. But there's a scene in the movie where Robin Williams plays uh, Garp and he, he is uh, newly, a newlywed and he's going to buy this beautiful farmhouse that they've always been wanting to buy. It's a house on a farm and there's a big uh, farmhouse right next to it. And they're about to sign the papers. And they're talking to the realtor and they're getting ready. And he puts the papers on the, on the car, on the hood of the car. And all of a sudden you hear this, <laughs> an airplane, clearly in distress. And they look off the, over the tree line. Here comes this small Cessna, comes, barely makes it over the tree line and rams right into the farmhouse. And the pilot survives and gets up and goes, you okay down there? And everybody's like, yeah, are you okay? And he's like, yeah, I'm okay. And so the wife looks at the husband at, 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 at uh, Robin Williams and goes, oh, my gosh, thank God we didn't get in the house. And he goes, give me the papers. And he signs. 
And the wife's like, what did you do? You just bought a damaged house. And he looks at her and goes, honey, darling, it's catastrophe proof. What are the odds of something like this ever happening again? There's my joke for the evening. That is the fallacy of return periods, right? Return uh, of uh, saying, hey, once every hundred years or once every thousand years, okay? Uh, it's a wonderful little quote that I use, or a little uh, part of a movie that I use in class to talk about return periods are all well and good, but it's a percent chance per year that you want to focus on. Our hazard is lower, but it's still significant, and we must respect it. We are entering the third, uh, we're coming into the, uh, the heart of hurricane season as we enter August. Uh, really late August to early September is our trouble spot. You saw those major storms when they came. When they do come right here in this area for us, it's right here in September. Everybody tends to get them then. If we survive August and September, we do get some in June, by the way, and that little threat has been growing for us, but it's usually not a major storm. But it's June for the smaller storm. I don't like calling them smaller storms because they're not small storms. The uh, not major hurricanes, you don't know such thing as a minor hurricane. Then we enter August and September is our big threat. If we survive September, we usually have very low odds. And you can see that here. These are the last couple slides I'm going to show. Where these storms come from, the southeast, the south southeast, and a little bit from the east and their categories. You can see the strong categories of the blue, the green, and the light blue coming from these two directions down here, with a couple coming this way early on. When do they happen? June, August, September. Doesn't mean it's not gonna happen in July. It's only happened once in October, and it's not never happened in November. Doesn't mean we'll probably get two this year in November with my luck. And not only is this threat related to the coast, there's a huge fallacy out there that if you're inland, like my parents would say, well, if we do evacuate, we're going to evacuate to McAllen. Uh, and, okay, it's like taking five feet away from a gunshot. All right, you're, you're still going to get impacted. You might survive. You don't want to be on South Padre Island. You want to be away from the storm surge. And the eastern side of Brownsville is threatened, can be damaged by extremely large storm surge. But you can see the return from a wind analysis and even a hurricane analysis, these do reach inland and they pack a wallop and they bring tornadoes. Beulah's devastating damage was insignificant, uh, uh, aside from the storm surge on the coast, the flooding in Harlingen and in, in, in Mexico, resulting from some failures of these diversion dams and systems, uh, were the 100 and some, 140 some tornadoes that were spawned in South Central and Central Texas as a result of the storm interacting and making a sudden churn. Uh, with a, uh, a frontal system. And those tornadoes were devastating. So it's not only a coastal threat. Last slide, we have a massive protection system from flooding in the valley that many people know some about, but few people know a lot about. And I don't have the time to discuss all of it, but it is a three-pronged system. It is a system that relies on dams to hold back, big dams to hold back the water, okay, like Anzaldúas and Falcon. Smaller dams like, Anzal, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Amistad and Falcon. Smaller dams like Anzaldúas, south of Mission in Rathamal, south of Mercedes, uh, that divert water inland, or away, excuse me, away from the river and pr to protect Brownsville and Matamoros, and then a system of levees that helps keep water um, uh, wow, four, really four feet of water in three rivers. Good heaven. That's a lot of rain. Um, the, um, floodways and diversion systems were designed primarily decades ago to protect the lower, lower valley that was right on the river and along the coast. Now the center, the epicenter of the valley's population is more over this way in McAllen, but Harlingen is right in the center of the Arroyo the North Floodways uh, option and one of the major diversion channels for the river. And that is a constant issue of concern from the International Boundary Water Commission saying we need to balance the beauty and natural benefits of the tree lines and the riparian forest of the Arroyo and all the beautiful parks that are springing up around it with the hydraulic conveyance and need to move water through that system rapidly. 
and that is an ongoing struggle uh, and deciding whether how much how many trees you need to cut down, what kind of trees, what are the what is the the, the point of doing this, how much should you do it? Um, because they serve very important systems. And you can see basically water being held up by the dams, water being diverted into the main floodway, the north floodway and the arroyo on the US side, and the Mexican floodway here. And these this system, along with levees, is strongly protective of us. Does not mean we're not going to get flooded. This means big river flooding, the big type of river flooding that we used to get uh, periodically, is largely tamed for the valley as a whole. But it doesn't mean we don't have storm surge, wind damage, and of course, localized heavy rainfall and all the flooding that we see happen from that. But that's usually not fast moving water and that usually doesn't come with really high winds. Like I'm talking about a, a thunderstorms or frontal systems that can cause minor periodic you know, damage, can spawn a tornado, but often torrential rain and standing floodwaters. And that type of flooding, okay, does take a does take a back seat to this type of flooding. It takes a back seat as far as expenditures. It takes a back seat because it's normally usually not killing or harming people directly. It's causing damage. You compare that to the uh, uh, flash flood alley of San Antonio and Austin, where when they do have these uh, frontal systems that come through, that water is not only uh, stand, uh, it's not standing, it's fast moving and will wipe away cars, houses, and people and causes, uh, unfortunately, several deaths. So we're, we have to study and look at this uh, problem from both nature's holistic standpoint and saying what natural systems can we preserve as master naturalists to help protect us from this flooding, from storm surge, from rainfall, from winds, uh, and, 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 and buffer that, and also how can we continue to engineer and modify the system so that it does provide us protection during these uh, rare but significant events. With that, I'll wrap up the talk and entertain questions. I've got one on storm surge. Did, okay. the, 30, did the 33 storm cause a significant surge? I have read a little bit about that storm, and I don't see a lot of data on storm surge. But that's again, I'm not the, uh, I'm not the, it's not the end all be all. I'm not the end all be all expert on that. Uh, but I would be surprised if it didn't. Uh, there has been um, some rules of thumb as far as storm surge is concerned, with um, uh, the um, like every category being like a category one being like zero to three, category two, three to six feet storm surge. Uh, category three, six to nine. So the rule of three for the height of the, the, uh, the storm surge in the Gulf of Mexico, but that really depends on a lot of factors. You can have a category four storm with, with a seven foot storm surge. You can have a category two storm with a 10 foot storm surge. The other rule of thumb is largely every foot of storm surge has the potential to go in a half a mile to a mile. So let's say we have a category five storm with a 15 foot storm surge or a 20 foot storm surge. Let's say 20. God forbid, a 20 foot storm surge. Uh, if that comes this way, we're talking about uh, uh, inland effects of 10 to 20 miles. That includes Eastern Brownsville in the process. And on another talk that I'm happy to talk to you about uh, or present uh, again to you all is the role of the Rosacas and the natural levees of the Rosacas and how that particularly the Rancho Rosaca around Brownsville, the Rosaca Rancho Viejo that curves around Brownsville, how that has protected Brownsville, but the Brownsville area long before Brownsville was there, uh, from storm surge effects. And the same thing with Rosaca de los Cuatas. In fact, they kind of they kind of do that. So when the hurricane comes in, they they funnel that storm surge funnels in that area, in and around uh, um, the uh, Palo Alto battlefield, around the Bahia Grande. Uh, and and uh, just east and south of Los Fresnos, and that's why you see a lot of those saline soils there because it's trapped between those higher Rosaca systems. So Rosaca system, the natural levees are 15 feet higher than that land around, than the land just to the east of it, a few miles east, and that serves as natural barriers uh, uh, to that. So that's a that's a good question. My, my suspicion is that it did have significant storm surge 
that impacted that saline soil area we have around Palo, or Palo Alto. Any other questions? We have a question from Facebook. Are the levees fixed yet? <laughs> Uh, always in the process of being fixed, right? Uh, the um, um, the whether or not a levy is fixed depends on a lot of factors, and whether or not they're certified depends on that. They are certified; they are going to be recertified. It looks like that I've heard uh, across the board. Um, they are; they do have the free board according to our modeling that they need. In other words, the water surface, the water elevation doesn't cross uh, or come up within uh, uh, the um, uh, one foot freeboard that you're supposed to have, I'm sorry, the three foot freeboard you're supposed to have. Um, but again, any mechanical system, any human made system can fail and will fail. It's just a matter of time. Uh, you just like you said, that false sense of security you get with the with the world according to GARP effect of return period, you can get the same thing with levees and diversion systems. And you say that I that we are very well protected. When river flooding doesn't mean that river flooding can't happen. The dams can fail, the levees can fail, uh, dikes and diversion dams can fail, um, and uh, we just hope they don't. And we plan for the best, and we and uh, our plan for the worst, and and hope for the best. Other questions? How about the uh, impact uh, of the uh, runoff on the salinity of the Laguna Madre? That's a very good question. Yeah, uh, so I assume you're talking about the freshening of the system. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. This this diversion system here, uh, back in 2010, when it was operated continuously for five to six weeks, um, because the longest period it had ever been operated, basically turned the Laguna Mother into a freshwater lake for a few weeks, um, and uh, because so much water again. This, the river does not, the river's mouth doesn't empty into the Laguna, as most people know, or some people don't. Uh, it, it, it empties directly into the Gulf. The Arroyo does, uh, and the Rosaka systems uh, do, when they do when they do flow, when they very, very rarely do flow, uh, and the overland patterns and all these drainage ditches flow and, and flow into the Laguna. So they're bringing nutrients and fresh water. So when we divert fresh water from the river, the, the person asking the question, sorry, I didn't catch the name, uh, is 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 right and in fact we are seeing slightly lowering salinities in the lower laguna madre uh, over time because of the increased freshwater uh, uh runoff not necessarily because of storms but because of returned wastewater mccallan mm -hmm. and up the valley pumping water for use and then returning it to the arroyo and then that arroyo the arroyo is depositing it as the as the valley becomes more populated and more and more water is being used for drinking, that means more and more wastewater, uh, and that uh, water is going to it's this slow, steady, the death of a thousand cuts type of thing that concerns me with the Lower Laguna Madre. Not so much the pulse freshwater because the system's adapted to that. I think somewhat it will take time to come back, but that slow decrease of the hypersalinity, which is so important for seagrasses. And so important for the seagrass support of the fish that we that we uh, that we uh, that we rely on for sport fishing uh, is is uh, is a big potential, a, a big concern. And there are we are pushing for some long term studies on that and trying to help parks and wildlife, uh, fish and wildlife, uh, and the GLO uh, to fund some research work on that and see uh, that requires a lot of long term uh, water quality monitoring, which is happening. And it requires a type of modeling that, frankly, we're not yet very good at. Um, so again, a big question mark. Very interesting for research, but anyone that gives you a definitive answer to that, to you, sir, unfortunately, I think is, is I will say, pushing the boundaries of scientific truth. Okay, thank you. Yep, absolutely. But it is a major concern. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Not to change the subject, but the drought in Mexico is having an impact there. Monterey's out of water. And are we going to see more and more controls on that? More and more what control? We're Sorry. losing your audio, Tony. The drought in the valley. I mean, the drought in Mexico. Has... Yeah, Can you hear me now? 
Yes, much better. Okay. The drought in Mexico is severe, at least yeah. in Monterey and other areas. Are we going to see it trickle down this way? And how severe will it be, do you think? The drought? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, again, I'm not a climatologist. Uh, you know, this is pro this is most likely due to this triple La Nina we had, right? This is the, the third year of La Nina. Uh, that we're entering a third cycle La Nina, which is very rare. Uh, whether that's tied to climate change or anything else is, is too premature to say. Uh, but this La Nina has really dried us out of this repeated long term La Nina cycle. Um, at this point, you know, uh, you know, knock on wood, you know, a, a small uh, tropical storm or a rain producer is uh, is again probably going to be a saving grace for us. Uh, more likely to form during the La Nina cycle, which is a counterbalance to the overall drying effect that we have. Uh, we'll see. But this dry heat, I mean, this, uh, well, actually, it is a dry, it's still very humid, but drier than average. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a concern. I, I doubt that we'll see a fourth year of La Nina. I mean, this cycle needs to break at some point. Uh, I hope it's not something that's shifted uh, beyond its normal, natural uh, uh, comfort zone uh, and settled in in a, in a, you know, in a new equilibrium, uh, because that's going to be drastic for us. But I, I don't, I don't think so. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we weathered. Uh, this is a severe, what I would expect, a severe shorter term drought. But we'll have to see. Control of water, control of water by Mexico is is going to be exacerbated by it. Yeah, and stopping a lot of the freshwater return. So we're going to feel the impact of this for the next several years, as far as water debt accumulating again. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you so much, Tony. Good to see you. Uh, good to uh, speak with you again. Good to see you. Any other questions? Yeah, we had one uh, in chat. Uh, she was curious, uh, what's the fuel used on that Navy ship that you mentioned? That didn't need to be refueled? Yeah, uh, uranium. Yeah, nuclear fuel. The nuclear, two nuclear reactors, 550 megawatt. That's declassified now. Each, uh, each reactor can uh, produce 550 megawatts. A power, the vast majority of that goes to the to pushing the ship, uh, but about ten percent of that, fifteen percent of that goes to electricity. Uh, to put it um, to put it in perspective, let's see. The other day, last week, Texas pulled uh, as far as demand. I think it was eighty-eight thousand megawatts. So you're talking about eighty-eight aircraft carriers could power all of Texas in the middle of the summer, um, and that's in the middle of the summer. But one aircraft carrier, like the Harry S. Truman, and it's two. 550 megawatt nuclear reactors uh, could power the vast majority of the valley on a on a hot day. Yeah, they are they are tremendous. Uh, nuclear power is high risk, high reward, uh, but the risk is coming down thanks to the French and others that and us that have developed much more stable, safe reactor operations than we have had in the past, particularly uh, four, three or four decades ago. Uh, and there's rumbling right now, a lot of talk about in the state of Texas about it being our next. Um, uh, gap fuel or bridge fuel to um, to full sustainable energy, um, and uh, you know, the, again, it just comes that comes down to not in my backyard. I don't I I want the electricity, but I don't want the the radioactivity anywhere near me. So you know, where do you put it and how do you operate it? And and if we're going to go that route, we need to make the decision fast because it takes ten years to build one. Um, so it ain't going to be our short term fix at least not immediate short-term fix for the electrical power. But yeah, I had a blast on the Truman. It was um, something that um, that taught me a lot about looking engineering a different, a very different way than I was taught classically at Notre Dame. Yeah, our next two questions, I think you touched on a little bit. Um, what are the chances of a hurricane coming uh, to the valley this year? And uh, also, has the drought conditions and population increased in the region affected our readiness for a large storm? Um, you know, nobody can predict the future. Uh, our, our, our odds are slightly higher than normal because of La Nina. What La Nina does, it, it takes away, it lowers um, um, the, uh, uh, the, the tearing apart of the hurricanes, the, the, the winds, the, the winds, the shear, Okay, is not as strong uh, during a La Nina pattern out in the Gulf, which means these hurricanes can stack. It needs to stack itself, and it can and it can stand vertically more easily. 
in, during an El Nino, you, st you get a lot more higher upper level winds moving in one direction, lower level mo winds moving the other direction, and that tends to tear hurricanes apart. We call that the uh, atmospheric shear, and that shearing is low during a La Nina cycle. Water temperatures are very warm, um, and so odds are that you know they're, they're predicting a more active hurricane season. So our odds are slightly higher than usual, but again, they are effectively comparatively low. But that doesn't mean anything when the hurricane strikes you. So if I had to bet, I'd say slightly above above average, but our average is lower than most people think. So hopefully we'll get lucky again. As far as the second, yes, absolutely. Droughts, when you have too little water, uh, people stop thinking about when you have too much water. When you have too much water, people stop thinking about when you have too little water. And we live in a part of the world that's right in the right on the boundary, not only with another country and, and the coastline, but we live on a biome boundary. We live on that right between the continental or the uh, humid subtropical uh, and a continental type of more uh, uh, biome and that type of that mix of humid subtropical uh, versus, I'm sorry, not, not continental, humid subtropical versus dry semi-arid, uh, you know, means that when we shift one way or the other, our average amount of rainfall across the valley is 20 to 30 inches more in the eastern side along the coast and less up towards McAllen and Rio Grande City. Uh, so 20 to 30 inches of broad range. But our standard deviation is significant. It means it's not uncommon for us to get 10 to 15 inches. Or, well, it's uncommon, but it's not that rare for us to get only 10 to 15 inches of rain a year. And it's not that rare for us to get 35 to 40 inches of rain a year. So we have a huge spread. And so we have to deal with everything. We're not like Seattle with a constant steady amount of rainfall. We're not like the dry bones area of the world that you know deal with very, very little rainfall. We have an average that's right smack in the slightly lower than average globally, but with a huge standard deviation. And so we have to cover it all. And uh, so we have to meet the challenges of being on a river that is flashy, meaning often low flow, but sometimes high. The, the challenges of living along the coast, the challenges and advantages of living along a, a, a national border, and the challenges of living along a biome border that express uh, meteorologically a broad uh, uh, brush of rainfall patterns. Other questions? I believe that's it. There's several thank yous and enjoyed it. And it was a a, a great presentation. We do appreciate it so much. Thank you, Thank you for, much, for being here for us whenever we ask. You've never said Absolutely. no. Thank Absolutely. you. My pleasure. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of the, I think you have another class and then you go on. Yeah, we have a business meeting and then that'll be it for the evening. So thank you. Enjoy. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Okay. The rest of the week. Thanks, Jude. Bye-bye. All right. We'll go on into the business meeting and hopefully get this over pretty quickly. There's not a whole lot of information. Um, the treasurer's reports were attached and I don't think there was anything um, too unusual in the treasurer's reports, just some routine, a little bit of income from dues that uh, uh, we'd been making some calls to follow up on. And um, otherwise it was just a normal activity. Uh, you can look that over. If you ever have questions, you can always um, uh, email our treasurer, Gail Rice. And um, Gail, do you have anything to add to that? No, as you said, it was it was uh, just a little bit of activity for this month, so not too much going on. All right. We thank you. Appreciate all your work on those and keeping track of all that. Uh, the minutes of the last meeting were attached. Elizabeth Eddy, who's here this evening, uh, took those minutes for us, and she's taking them again tonight. We thank you very much. Uh, if you notice anything that needs changing or correcting, uh, misspelled name or something, or if you weren't included as a, in attendance, you can always email her um, or, or me and let us know, and we'll correct those minutes. And otherwise, We'll accept both the treasurer's report uh, for um, our audit and the minutes uh, as printed uh, with corrections pending if anything is brought to our attention. Okay, 
committee reports. Ronnie is not here tonight. He did submit to us his committee report for membership, and I sent those as an attachment um, to the minutes. And um, Elizabeth is asking for Marilyn's last name for today's attendance. And also, if there's more than one of you online, uh, I know Karen and Kathy, both their names are there. But if you have more than one person online, you might add that information in the chat for Elizabeth to add to the minutes. Thank you. So back to the membership director report. Um, he said in June 22, there were 117 hours entry eligible members. That means they were active and, and uh, up to date and could be doing volunteer work. There were 24 unique members logged service hours and AT hours through 14 different service opportunities. That means different opportunities where we could go volunteer, whether it's citizen science, um, uh, public outreach, or just volunteering at one of our local you know, public outreach or whatever. There were 24 unique members logged volunteer hours and 16 members logged AT hours. In June of 2022, that means there were 227.5 total approved service hours, which had direct uh, impact of $6,492.85. And that's based on our hours being calculated to be a value of $28.54 an hour. And we had direct outreach impact on 25 adults and two youth, and a total of 20.25 total approved advanced training hours. And that was attached um, as, a, as an attachment, so you have those uh, to include in the minutes. Elizabeth, so you don't have to go hunt up and write all that information down. Um, Anne, did you, or James, I saw him on here too. Do you have anything to report on the 2023 class? No, I don't think, Jim, I have anything to report um, this month. Um, I mean, we are looking at watching COVID and um, how the numbers are going up, so it doesn't look good for our in-person class right now. But right. we'll get into that the next education committee. All right, thank you. I know she and James have been had their heads together looking over things and getting things organized ahead of time, and so they're on the ball and following up. River, I saw you are here. Do you have something for our awards and recognitions? Yes, I do. Um, we have uh, two recertifications, and they are Dana Austin and John Thaxter. So oh, congratulations right. to them, yes. And that's it. Well, congratulations to you both. I know Dana's here tonight. All right. Uh, Joseph, you want to give us any information about the the website and what's going on there these days? I was trying to pull up the numbers, but I don't have them right here. Um, we have a little bit more traffic than usual on our website. Uh, people are starting to be interested in TMN classes again. Um, we're getting about three contacts a month uh, in the last two months. Uh, so we're adding them to our, our list and let them know about uh, upcoming meetings and we'll send them an email when uh, registration starts. Uh, and Anita's blogs are still popular. She had one on the what's growing in the cracks of the sidewalk. I uh, got a lot of uh, interest from a lot of different areas and uh, might get a, a, a sequel post. So if you have some crack, some stuff growing in the cracks that wasn't included in her previous article, uh, send her some pictures. All right. And then I guess the next uh, thing is, unless Anita, you have anything to add there? Or? I do, am I moved? Can you hear me now? Oh, we can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah, I, uh, and this is, um, concerns you as well, Joseph, but uh, mothing, the, the national moth, annual national moth week, it starts the 23rd and goes for 
uh, through the 31st. So the latest blog is about mothing and it's pretty lengthy and there's a lot of links in it. If you haven't looked at it, uh, do because it ends with the tutorial on how to do mothing in your own backyard that uh, Joseph wrote a couple of years ago. And I think you've kept it up and I'll, I reread that periodically. And one of the things that I <laughs> picked up in this, this, uh, the read that I did the other day was if you really want to attract moths, wear a white shirt. <laughs> that was really funny uh, because you don't want to do that because you want the moths to be on your moth sheet, not on your clothes. But that, that was, uh, Funny, Joseph puts uh, funny things in once in a while, and you really have to look for them. At any rate, I want to mention that the uh, the moth the mothing uh, blog got a lot of uh, visibility because I sent it to both um, of our valley chapters and our sister chapter up north, uh, with the uh, the three counties up north of us uh, also put it on their blog, and then it goes to the the uh what not blog the facebook and then the facebook for the texas south texas echo tourism they they posted it up there too so let's see oh and be a, pay attention to the the facebook because joseph has compiled a lot of the events that are going to be in the area for mothing week and hopefully he's going to do a couple of them himself Oh, good. Thanks. There it is. Yeah, this is uh, in right. our Facebook uh, right here. The the dates: Quinta Mazatlan, Stero, Benson, uh, and Oleander Acres. Which uh, I'm for sure going to be at that one. I'm hoping to be at a bunch of other ones. I don't know how many I can do in one week, but uh, I like all the places and uh, I like mothing. So I'm going to do as many as I can. Very good. And I know, like Anita said, I had read her blog, linked over to the information, uh, the link she gave us for uh, Joseph's blog. And I went out and got me one of those lights that I'm going to put in my porch light fixture and uh, run it in You're the a convert. I'm a convert. <laughs> and then I'll have to replace that light with something that's uh, bird friendly and... <laughs> <laughs> we'll get all those taken care of one of these days. Listen, the, the birds will come and get the moths. <laughs> so killing two birds with one stone. No, no pun intended there. <laughs> uh, and Joseph, while we still have you here, would you like to say something about our bat field trip? And I know Elizabeth, you arranged that. Thank you so much. And you were there too, in case you want to chime in after Joseph, go ahead. Yeah, we had a good time. Uh, I think uh, River told me about 20 people total. Um, we didn't see quite as many bats as we were hoping, but there were still some big, big groups come out. Uh, and uh, a new purchase for our chapter is this uh, little bat detector, which plugs into your phone, lets you record uh, the uh, bat sounds and lets you play them like at, while we were out at the uh, uh, out at the bridge. And let me see if I can show you that. Uh, it's hiding my buttons. There we go. Well, these are the species that are, our iNaturalist knows are in the area. Uh, I talked to an expert, uh, he says there's 14 species possible down here. So there, uh, you can see most of these only have one observation because there's just not a lot of bat studying going on around here, uh, at least on iNaturalist. Uh, but this is what our bat detector does. Uh, it records this, and this is a, a display of how the sound is. These real tall ones are a certain type of bat, and these short ones are another type of bat. And so the guy that contacted me about bat audio says, uh, you've got two different bats there, so we can't identify it. Uh, you have to separate the two. So I've learned uh, a lot more about bats than I have known uh, in the last week. Uh, and so I'm gonna have to improve my uh, my iNaturalist upgrade uploads and uh, see if we can actually get some some audio um, of the bats around here. He said that there's just not a lot of, I, I think I'm the only one that's posted any from iNaturalist so far. And because the uh, chapter has paid for this little thing, uh, if anybody else wants to get into bats and, and borrow it, 
uh, it's not mine. It's everybody's. Uh, and I don't plan to be using it all the time either. I, I used it out. Uh, uh, when I was out looking for spiders, I had the bat detector in one hand, the camera in the other and a flashlight in my third hand. It doesn't really work well. So, uh, if somebody else wants to pick up and learn a lot about, about bats, uh, I'd be very happy to pass this on. Joseph, didn't you say we had vampire bats down here? Uh, they're further south. Uh, as far as I know, they don't make it this far up. Okay. I'd also like to uh, interject that anyone that's um, used to doing iNaturalist for Moth Week, please, please do that. Um, if not every day or every night, um, try to take some pictures of moths and, and shoot it up to iNaturalist and if you'll read that Facebook page, uh, you can get volunteer time. Uh, there are some other activities where you might be able to get AT time. So anyway, can participate in Moth Week. Uh, and congrats, uh, Donna, I'm proud of you. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to, to uh, say also that um, it was it was just so nice to see everybody at the bat field trip, even though we didn't see as many bats as we'd hoped. We got to see each other and lots of people brought books that we looked at as well as the bad equipment and it was it was really good. It'll be my my last field trip here. I will still be arranging some for you all to go on and hopefully Joseph and others will share pictures so I can go. Yay. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I love field trips, so it was really nice. We got to have one last one while I'm still here. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, is Kathy Tom still here? Yes. Do you have anything to add, Kathy? I know at the over under um, our other events, AT, I have uh, mentioned the uh, annual meeting, and I put the link to it that uh, the schedule is up. Yes, thanks, Donna. That's going to be October 22nd to the 23rd in Houston, and it looks at this time that they're going to do it in person, but who knows? They may change it yet. Also, I want to thank the members who have recently paid their dues. We're still collecting membership fees for 2022 of only $15. So now we're up to 88 paid members. All right. Well, thank you. Um, that's training. Of course, we don't have anybody in that position right now. Elizabeth's been helping us with some of that, and I know I've been trying to spot things and other people have been providing us information. So thank you, those of you who share that information um, with our other members or with Joseph or I or Elizabeth so we can post it. Uh, any of these TM and Tuesdays, the recordings can be watched for AT, so if you missed them in person, you can watch those. Um, they're usually the week before our meeting, and they don't always say what the next program is going to be by this week, so I could announcement announce that. But the TMN Tuesdays are available for watching. Um, and then on Saturday, August sixth, uh, Dr. Hudson DeYo is hosting a public meeting at Valley Nature Center, and um, a little flyer is there, and he's going to be talking about um, the bay, getting to know your bay. And so that might be interesting for several of us. And um, I would assume I, I, that that could be for advanced training since it's pertinent to our region and the topic that we're interested in. So um, those those people, especially the Valley Nature Center, that's nice that they're hosting that uh, for us on Saturday, August 6th. And then our annual meeting, and I put the link to that. Registration is not going to open yet, but at least you can get an idea of what activities there are. And there are contests and stuff that members can enter, and all those rules and regulations are on the website. Um, Susan Coleman is not here this evening. For some reason, she decided she was going to go to a grandson's soccer or baseball game up in Eugene, Oregon, rather than get online with us. So I guess we'll excuse her for that opportunity. She tries to keep uh, opportunities posted. Um, Quinta Monsalon still has some summer camps uh, through the month and uh, could possibly still use volunteers if you want to touch base with them. Also, uh, Gabriel Montalvo is now working at Edinburgh World Birding Center. 
and he's needing some volunteers to help in the garden areas, and there may be other work that he'll be um, uh, developing as a new member up there. So if you can get hold of him, I have his email there. If you're interested in working up there, they could use some help. And our Red Crown Parrot Count is going to be the evening of July 22nd, and hopefully this year again, like, or this quarter, like last quarter, the counters will not outnumber the number of birds we see. <laughs> That's That has happened a couple of times, so we look forward to seeing big flocks of red crowned parrots, and I include the contacts so that you could email um, any of those contact people and join them at the locations indicated. And then we've already mentioned Moth Week, and um, that's most of the service projects and AT. And I just have a couple of more announcements to make. Is there anybody else that has any um, questions to ask or uh, questions about any of what we've discussed? I know we've gone over it quickly. Okay, then I'll just announce that our next board meeting is August 1st, and our next general meeting is August 15th. And uh, Bill Rich, who's a member, is going to be telling us about the Passion Vine, and I think it's going to be very interesting. He's already sent me some additional information to share with y'all when the time comes, so uh, we look forward to that presentation next month on August 15th. The only other thing I will announce is that our board meeting, we did discuss the fact that um, since COVID cases are increasing in the Valley, uh, several of our members have indicated they've had COVID or have it now, uh, or have family members that have been sick. Um, we have made the decision to not do any in-person meetings yet. We'll readdress that uh, in the fall before time to make the decision for our January uh, classes so we can determine whether we want to try doing in-person meetings for the classes um, and whether or not we want to try in-person meetings later this fall um, or if we need to postpone it a few more months. Uh, I want to um, stay on the side of caution. I uh, would not want to see anybody get sick. I know it's not as serious an illness for most, it seems, uh, but people still get sick and um, you still don't know what any long-term effects might be. So I would rather err on the side of caution and and the board agreed that we should just hold off on in-person meetings for uh, at least a few more months. So we'll keep you posted on that. All right, I have it 8.02. I think we can say we had a 15 minute or Point two five business meeting and uh, hour and 15 minutes. So that's 60, 75 minutes of AT for our, our presentation, uh, our speaker. And anybody else have anything they want to say? I don't see any hands going up. Oh, Bill wanted me to uh, read out the, the subtitle of his next presentation. Oh, yes. Next Go month. ahead and do that. Yes. So the title is The Passion Vine Diaries, A Story of Three Years of Grapevines, Pink Flowers, Orange Butterflies, Giant Bees, Spiky Caterpillars, Ant Police, and Killer Stink Bugs. So sounds pretty interesting. And sounds like it. He's one of our class members of uh, this year. So... If anybody else has something you're working on or want to work on, uh, let us know. We, you don't have to be years worth of expertise in the membership uh, to uh, present. Yeah, you. Many people come to us with expertise already, and we appreciate their their joining us and uh, sharing their expertise. And especially okay. if you want to do a back presentation, get started. <laughs> My only bad experience was when I was in college i took a wildlife biology class and our field trip to mexico was to help the mexican government we set up bat traps nets and we collected the vampire bats that were attacking the the um uh mexican cattle and we were uh collecting samples for testing to see if they had any diseases they were passing on to the cattle wow 
So that was fun, and one of my outdoor experiences it lasted a week, and we got to camp out on the beaches of a closed state park down there, and uh, it was quite fascinating, and lots of fun. So if, if that's all, then, I think we can uh, close the meeting, and uh, I wish everybody well, and enjoy Moth week off couple of months the month is it i guess it starts the 22nd and goes through the 31st yeah so, it's a little bit i think a little a day or so more than a week yeah so i uh, enjoy that and um enjoy getting some volunteer time doing some posting on nine naturalists hopefully and uh, thank you all for attending hey uh, uh, Don, uh, go ahead. one more thing i wanted I want to go to over the times for our presentation, that was an hour. Then it was an hour and fifteen minutes. Oh, an hour and fifteen. So one point two five hours when you record it. Yeah, one point two five. And then the general, the general meeting. It was just fifteen. Fifteen minutes, so point two five. All right. So that pretty much takes up. Okay. Eight o'clock. So. All right. Thank you. All right, goodbye everybody. Have a good evening. Adios.